So as in closing out the professional track, uh, we wanted to um, um, emphasize my time gets free type two. The foundation has a keen interest in trying to um, stimulate more interest in my time dystrophy type two. And that's what our last three presentations are going to deal with. And the first one is from um, Johanna Hamel, um, who will speak on disease severity and progression in DM2. All right, so I'll get started. <clears throat> Again, I will be speaking about our studies of disease progression in DM2. And to start off, let's uh, think about where we are. Um, rapid advances are made in DM1. We heard a lot about it yesterday and today and from our patients. And we can. the, the question is, can we harness the momentum for therapeutic development in DM2? And Following that question, um, it raises the concern, what are the commonalities between DM1 and DM2 and what are the differences and how do we need to account for the differences? And so following up on that, I'm presenting here on our current efforts in clinical research to clear the path for therapeutics in DM2 and our attempts to kind of answer those questions. The first approach to shed light on the commonalities between DM1 and DM2 is, is a study utilizing the National Registry of DM that's housed in Rochester. And you may have seen data presented from the registry on DM1 uh, because we have a lot of patients, over 900 patients with DM1 enrolled. Um, but we have also a decent amount of participants with DM2. And so this study included 222 participants with DM2. And the methods of the registry may be familiar to you, but just as a reminder, um, the registry was founded in 2001 uh, or, or initiated in 2001 in Rochester. And since then, participants um, have received annual mailings um, with a survey that asks questions about their perceived disease burden. So questions like, have you started using an ankle brace? Have you started using a wheelchair? Has a pacemaker being placed, et cetera, among other questions. And so people return those mailings to us and we have created this data set that anyone who is interested and applies to use it can use for to answer their research questions. And so when we looked at um, the data set just recently, it included um, up to 17 years of longitudinal data from registry members. And on average, because not everyone returned their survey every single year, on average, the longitudinal follow-up uh, was covering seven years. And the range was large though. So there are people that have just been in it for a year or returned their survey only um, at one year. And then there are people who have um, returned every single survey over 17 years. And all that data flew into this study. Now, there are a little bit more uh, women than men. There were uh, about 60% of women in this study. And again, 222 participants with DM2. Now, I will orient you to these graphs because they will all look a little similar, showing the um, each milestone. Um, on the y-axis, you see the probability of using or meeting a milestone. For example, the probability of using a walker. One is everyone uses a walker, zero, no one uses a walker. And on the x-axis, the age. And you see that the, the, the risk of needing um, a walker increases with age. In the dashed line, you see DM2. In the solid line, you see DM1. And so what we learned from these graphs that, by the way, I also use in the clinic because Participants, you know, newly diagnosed with DM2 ask me, what can I expect? What does this look like? And um, with an attempt to answer these questions, these graphs can be helpful. But what we see here, for example, is that the risk of developing uh, the risk of using a wheel uh, a walker at age 50 is about 10% in um, in DM2, and it's it increases to about 28% at age 60. Now, moving on to wheelchair use, again, similar graph, just showing the risk of using a wheelchair over time and with age, uh, with increasing age. And here you see that about 13% of people uh, with DM2 um, have had the, the need to use a wheelchair up to age 60. 
And then moving on to disability. And this question in the registry is specific. It's not just disability to, to anything, back pain, work injury, et cetera. No, it asks about disability due to myotonic dystrophy type two. And so what we see there is that up to age 40, um, the risk of having to stop to work because of DM2 is about 10%. And that is in a disease that generally speaking is considered to affect people at older age. So there is substantial disability before the typical age of retirement. And that's what the registry data here um, taught us. Now, going forward to other important milestones, um, the use of non-invasive ventilation, either for sleep apnea or for respiratory muscle weakness, again, you see that the risk of using non-invasive ventilation is higher in DM1 than in DM2, but um, the risk is uh, also present for DM2. So for example, at age 50, the risk of using non-invasive ventilation is about 12%. And just as a limitation here, we do not ask ask the question, have you been prescribed non-invasive ventilation and you can't use it? We ask, are you using non-invasive ventilation? So the people who should probably use it um, ideally is probably higher than what's representative and represented in this graph. Um, now, moving on to pacemaker placement, which again is an important milestone in a person's disease life. Um, and uh, when we look at, again, the risk of using a, using a pacemaker is greater in DM1, but it is present also in DM2. And up to age 60, about 8 to 10% of people have a pacemaker placed. Cancer. Uh, research has been done about the increased cancer risk in DM1, mostly in DM1. But what we found here, which was interesting, is that there is actually statistically no difference between the risk, the, the reported risk of developing cancer um, uh, with increasing age in, in DM1 and DM2. So in both forms of the disease, the risk of um, having a diagnosis of cancer up to age 60 is about 24%. <clears throat> now, moving on to diabetes, and you may have gotten used to look at this graph and see the solid line on top and the dashed line on the bottom, because generally speaking, the risks are higher in uh, DM1. But here you see that it's flipped around, and that was something we um, didn't know before. But um, the probability of developing diabetes is actually greater in DM2 compared to DM1. So, for example, um, in at up to age 60, the risk of developing diabetes is about 24% in DM2. And that's important for, for me in clinic to um, educate um, my patients as well. But now the question is, what are the mechanistic underpinnings for that? And we don't know, but um, um, possible hypothesis may be that the pattern of weakness may play a role where DM2 has pre preferentially affected proximal muscles that are larger. Um, so if there's an issue with insulin resistance in those muscles, that might have a greater impact on developing generally insulin resistance rather than the smaller distal muscles. Um, maybe the, um, the fact that there's less atrophy, uh, generally speaking, may play a role, um, or other tissues may be involved. For example, the liver tissue, um, hepatocytes, maybe they have a different um, uh, pattern of insulin resistance or fat tissue or even insulin secreting tissue. So for example, the, the pancreas, um, is, is there a, a difference in how these tissues are involved in DM2 compared to DM1? So conclusions are, it is feasible to collect data on disease burden in DM2 over a relatively long interval using registries. And I would like to uh, point out with that data that the impact of DM2 at older ages is still very considerable. And um, there is a decent amount of risk to use assistive devices such as a walker or a wheelchair. And again, the disability data is interesting because there is a risk of having to uh, retire early or become disabled due to DM2 uh, before the, the, retirement, the typical retirement age. Um, with uh, relevant socioeconomic consequences. Um, the higher risk of diabetes that I highlighted here is mechanic mechanistically interesting and um, warrants further study. With that, I would like to transition to the second uh, study, 
uh, which now I just uh, kind of focused on a whole long uh, interval of disease progression using the registry and looking at important milestones. But now I would like to focus in on a natural history study that covers three years of um, disease in a person's life. And um, this natural history study um, called STOP DM2 was our first step to obtain natural history study in DM2. And we were interested to look at what outcome measures are responsive to disease progression over those three years. And also we were interested in whether the splicing biomarkers that have been developed for DM1 and are currently used in clinical trials in DM1 can be directly applied to DM2 or whether modifications are required. And so um, we also did muscle biopsies in our participants. So what did the study look like? We enrolled people, um, by the way, it's still ongoing, but enrollment has closed. So we have uh, completed the baseline visits of 40 subjects, 33 have um, completed their one-year follow-up, and then 22 have completed their 20, uh, their 36 months follow-up, and we're still finishing up those, those visits. And we have 40 uh, individuals, again, a little bit more females, but fairly equal, 57% are, are females. And the age was broad. Um, the average age is 55, but we had subjects as young as 22 and as um, old as 77 participate. participate. Now here, um, and I work closely with uh, Kate Eichinger on this project. Um, we um, Here I'm highlighting the, the strength and function assessments that are done in this study. So manual muscle strength testing is done in the upper extremity and then the lower extremity and neck extensors and flexors. And then um, quantitative muscle strength assessments with QMA or QMT are done upper, also in the upper and lower extremities. And I'm just highlighting this here because you see, um, you know, you capture a lot more muscles with MMT than QMT, um, just the way these methods work. And I would like to just explain how we combined those muscles in the analysis. So we did a uh, MMT score for the upper extremity, including all of these. And then we uh, uh, analyzed MMT of the lower extremity, uh, including all the proximal and distal muscles of the lower extremity. And then um, we have an MMT T-score of all muscles, which then includes also the neck flexors and extensors. Other strength assessments were the six-minute walk test, time to ascend and descend four steps, time to stand up from a chair, and time to transverse 30 feet. Here in this slide, I would like to um, uh, show you data from MMT, so manual muscle strength testing at baseline of the DM2 uh, cohort, uh, highlighting the, the muscles that are most commonly weak, um, which we uh, uh, discovered in our analysis. And those muscles that are most commonly weak are neck flexion, hip flexion, hip abduction, and shoulder abduction. And on the x-axis here, you see the proportions of people that are weak and in the color coded color coding you see um, the this uh, the grade of weakness and so red is uh, red is a 5 so red means they have full strength and everything left to that means people were weak and the more you go to the left the we, um, the lighter the colors the weaker they are so for example um, more than 20% of people had no anti-gravity strength in their neck flexion. And then there were some people here that had no anti-gravity strength in their hip abduction. Um, and because of that here, um, we developed a, comp a proximal composite score in the analysis as well, including those particular muscle groups, which in the clinic just seem to be most affected and most severely affected. And now I will go from the baseline data to um, the, the, the data on um, longitudinal follow-up over the three years. Here you see the change in the average MMT score, so all muscles included. Um, at 12 months and at 36 months. So that just depicts the change. And what we see is a statistically um, significant uh, progression of that score at three years, but not at one year. Similarly here, just looking at manual muscle strength testing of the lower extremity, you see uh, a change in progression at three years, but not at one year. <clears throat> and then highlighting the proximal composite score that I just talked about, um, that shows the strongest progression at three years, um, but again, not at one year. So 
And then the proximal composite score also shows a strong correlation with the lower extremity function index at baseline. What is the lower extremity function index? It is a survey that people fill out on their own. It's self-reported perception of um, uh, impact of weakness. So they uh, people are asked how uh, about certain activities of daily living um, that um, involves the lower extremities. And the score is zero to 80. And um, the higher the score, the better the self-reported function. And what you see here on the y-axis is that the higher the self-reported function, the greater um, their strength on the proximal composite store, which is quite strong with a spearman correlation coefficient of 0.9. And then um, the time to go 30 feet was um, uh, people progressed over um, three years as well. You see a little trend here, but that was not statistically significant at 12 uh, months. And then um, similarly here, you see correlations at the baseline data from the time to go 30 feet um, uh, to the uh, QMT lower extremity and the MMT lower extremity scores. And I just uh, mentioned the QMT um, lower extremity strength data did not show progression in our study. But again, I highlighted before that the selection of muscles is limited for, for QMT and doesn't capture really the, the key muscles that we think are uh, most affected in DM2. And then the lower extremity function index that I just talked about um, shows uh, progression at three years as well. And here you see a drop as well, but um, it's not statistically significant at 12 months. Um, and then the lower extremity function index correlates also with the MMT score of the lower extremity with a correlation coefficient of 0.8. And then even though I'm talking a lot about lower extremity uh, function, um, uh, the upper extremity function index um, shows also progression at three years, um, not as much, but notable and statistically, statistically significant um, at three years. Now I want to shift um, and talk a little bit about the, the transcriptonic uh, changes um, because we collected uh, muscle biopsies from the TBLS anterior or TA muscle um, of most uh, participants. And this is work from Matt Tanner. Um, and what we are looking at here is the splice events are listed down here and the patients are listed here and the patients are color coded. We compared the patients with DM2 to patients with a DM1. And so this, you see the DM1 patients highlighted in red here and the DM2s in green. And then you see healthy controls in blue. And what you see is that the um, transcriptomic changes in DM1 and DM2 are relatively concordant, about 96% are, are similar, um, the, and they fall along a spectrum here of severity. So the red um, color coding here is the most severe uh, splicing derangement, and as it gets lighter, it's uh, less severe, and you see that they fall on the spectrum here from top to bottom, with DM1 most severe on the top, and then interspersed less affected DM1s and the DM2 patients, and then segregating from these healthy controls. And the one there's one interspersed here, uh, a, a mildly uh, affected DM1 patient. Um, but that uh, that was the the transcriptomic uh, splicing analysis by Matt Tanner. And so next slide, I would like to highlight some of these compared comparing again DM1, DM2, but also comparing different muscles. So to orient you here. Um, so on the left, so these are splice, six uh, uh, selected splice events, and it shows the percent spliced in. And so right up here, you see a healthy TA. Next to it, you see the um, percent spliced in for healthy quads, a uh, quadriceps muscle. Then you see um, data from 172 um, DM1 muscle biopsies of the TA. Then you see in green, the DM2 TA data, and then next to it, DM2 quadriceps um, data. And what you see here is that they that DM1 and DM2 fall along the same spectrum. Of course, there's more people with DM1 included here, um, but they both segregate uh, from uh, uh, separate out nicely from the healthy controls um, along those uh, uh, different splice events. And also from this data, um, you don't see a huge difference between the TA and the quadriceps. Now, um, there is a disclosure here because um, we did a biopsy from the TA 
and the quadriceps. And um, the issue is that these muscles are not preferentially affected in DM2, but they are in DM1. Um, and in fact, in our study on MMT, only 30% showed weakness in the TA or quadriceps in our DM2 participants. So what is needed as a next step is to um, biopsy and analyze uh, preferentially affected muscles in DM2. And this is something we are working on. So to conclude, um, disease progression in DM2 is slow, but it can be measured. Um, assessments of strength and function strongly correlate also with the um, self-perception of disease and function, in particularly when we preferentially selected muscles that are um, uh, affected in DM2 with a proximal composite score. The splicing analysis suggests that the tools already developed for DM1 can be applied to DM2, for example, to demonstrate target engagement. Um, but we are doing further studies uh, to uh, look at preferentially affected muscles in DM2. And overall, these studies support the, the feasibility of measuring disease burden and hopefully in the future drug effects in DM2. And with that, I would like to close and thank Kate and Mike McDermott and the whole team at the University of Rochester. And of course, most of all, I would like to thank all participants and their families for participation in this study. And thank you for the opportunity to present it. Uh, thank you for the great uh, work. Uh, I had a question. Uh, your data, did you stratify them by age uh, for DM2 or also age from onset of symptoms or years from onset of symptoms? Because I think that matters when you want to say where they are with the disease or how old they are. I think it would be helpful. To um, you mean for the first part, the milestone? Second. You... second. Oh, the second. Second. Uh, By uh, the way, so... for the, yeah, I can, I can comment on that because exactly that's important. And um by the way, for, for the first part, for the milestone uh, data, we did that too uh, for DM2, looking at uh, disease duration and age of onset. And that actually didn't uh, have an impact uh, on the data. It did for DM1, but uh, not for DM2. Um, and in, in the second part, um, we looked at that uh, for disease duration. Um, this is a preliminary analysis, and it didn't seem to be statistically significant, um, but the numbers are, are uh, maybe too small. So we have to look at that again when we have the full cohort. Thank you. Yeah. And second quick question. Did you look, ask for autoimmune diseases in your part one presentation like for, from patients? Any presence of autoimmune disease? Yeah, of, yeah. Um, we have that data um, because it's co comorbidities are collected in the registry as well as our medications that can give a clue. Um, but we did not include that in this analysis. Yeah. Thank you. Very nice, uh, Johanna. I have a question about whether you have any insight into uh, differences in repeat length in DM2 and DM1 and, and, and whether there are different threshold lengths that are required to see these changes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think um, you... Yeah, it's it's obvious that the it's technically uh, difficult in DM2. So nevertheless, uh, we did that analysis for the registry because we do have the repeat length on a decent amount of uh, participants done by, although dis disclosure done by commercial labs, um, and then it's entered into the registry. So we um, did an analysis whether repeat length um, <clears throat> has an impact on any of those milestones or outcomes, and it did not in DM2. In DM1, of course, there is a signal, and I published that, um, but in, in DM2, it did not. But that's difficult because, again, uh, I'm not so sure we can rely on the quality of those repeat lengths uh, based and uh, measured in commercial labs. But, of course, in the, in the studies moving forward, we are very interested in, in looking at that, including our biopsy studies. A quick question. Yeah. yeah. Great talk, Johanna. In terms of comparing DM1 and DM2 in progression, if you do the, the the comparison, is it is DM two maybe two to three fold slower in terms of progression, or just in terms of ballpark? I was just trying to get a, a understanding of that. 
Um, yeah, it depends on, on what you're looking at in terms of just muscle strength or the other outcomes. I mean, the, the milestones, you know, I kind of show it that it's uh, the odds ratios are usually between two and three um, uh, comparing the two diseases. And in terms of uh, functional outcomes, we would have to look at it, but it's, I would say two to threefold makes, makes sense that I think there's more of a signal in DM1 at year one, of course, um, than we found in DM2. So it seems like the progression is slower. Yeah. <clears throat> and just one follow-up to that in terms of we're lucky and or fortunate in DM1 to have the correlations with misplacing and functionality. Are, and maybe you've published this and I've missed it, but is there anything that you have good correlations with functionality and misplacing yet? In DM2. So um the we analyzed the first 16 people uh, biopsies of DM2 and we have more so that needs to be done still but in those first 16 um, participants there was no correlation to strength in the TA um, but um, again that is limited by that the TA is only weak in about 30 percent so it's really not that helpful so that's why we need to do um, that we need to cor uh, correlate it with a muscle that's actually affected in most people um, but again, the other question, could it still display, tar I mean, it could still be a marker of targeting agents. So even if we don't have that. Uh, thanks, Johanna. It's really exciting. I'm, I'm eager to see this move forward. I was in, curious about the diabetes uh, that you showed. D did you look at BMI? Was there a BMI difference between the, the two populations? Um, so Good question. The BMI is collected in the, in the registry, but we didn't look at that. Um, that's that's something we thought of because um, again, metabolic syndrome is a little bit more common in DM two, and um, wet muscle wasting again isn't isn't as common, and um, and dysphagia isn't as yeah. So that all makes sense that there might be less of a, a, a malnutrition issue, but um, that's something we we should look at in the in the future, um, definitely. Yeah. I, um, cataracts are highly prevalent in DM2. What, uh, what about Fuchs dystrophy? Do we know anything about that? Um, so we don't. I, I don't have uh, that uh, data, but I keep asking people um, if they have Fuchs coronal dystrophy. So far, I've only um, encountered DM1 patients with it. And then I had one family that um, had Fuchs, but then I teased out the, the pedigree and it came from the other side of the family. So I think that person actually has a TCF4 mutation and it's not due to DM2. I didn't prove that, but it's clearly in two, two, from two family trees so where the folks and the dm2 comes from but it looks like john may have yeah we have some families with dm2 and fuchs but we've raised the same question about whether or not it's the fuchs mutation it's just common yeah 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 we we actually modified our study protocol to, and it's in there to look for Fuchs, but then the pandemic hit. And so we, we didn't look, but we can. <laughs> yep. Okay. Thank you.